I'm a daughter of a costume designer, so I grew up uh, in my mom's costume shop picking up the scraps off the floor and being the recipient of donations that were given to her at the community college that she um, managed the, the shop of. And so she would get donations from estates that of people sewing stashes, and um, I would end up being able to pick through them at the end. They didn't need everything that came. And I traveled around my whole life with her from house to house of people who were helping her, and I have then since had plenty of jobs within the fiber arts as an adult, and I know what we all have in our houses. Mm. You know, I know, I've, I've seen it. And so I had this idea that the reason that we all collected so much was that, first of all, it's good instinct. Fabric is hard to make, actually, and so I think we have an instinct to grab and hold on to the good stuff when we find it. But also that there was just no nowhere good enough to hand it down, that the next natural part of the process is that it should go from one generation to the next. And because we've eliminated sewing programs from schools and everyone's too busy working, there aren't the, the children yet that are you know, in every family reliably to pass things down to. So um, I created Swanson's Fabrics as a place for people to bring their stashes and know that they would safely get passed on to the next generation. And we keep everything really affordable so that anyone who wants to sew can, because I just want people sewing. That's all I care about. And how exciting to do it at the start of COVID. Can you tell us about that? Well, yeah, it, COVID opened up some opportunities for me. I had a job I was supposed to get. I was an elementary school teacher. I was going to transition to teaching sewing at the local middle school and the job disappeared um, in lockdown. So I turned on a dime and I started Swanson's. I got a pod of fabric delivered to me from my um, friend in New Jersey. I used my stimulus check from the government and I uh, I just like had to, I, no one could tell me not to take the big risk. Everything was crazy and so I just sort of seized the day and I had nothing else I could really be doing at that time. Um, and I had a couple of tag sales. I was able to get uh, more inexpensive rent on my storefront because um, things had been closing down because of the pandemic. And everyone had been, you know, pulling out their sewing machines, reconnecting with their craft, going through all of their stuff, downsizing, and really like personally evaluating where all of our stuff comes from. We're having big conversations about supply chain now. Um, so it just all kind of like came together in this like great confluence that like actually worked quite well for, for creating this shop. And now there are lots of people all over the country who are trying to start their own. And so I'm building a network of people who are trying to start their own business like mine, wherever they are. Mm. And I think every, I think every town in America can sustain it. There are a few of us per family, which makes sense because before industrialization, that's what humankind needs is a few fiber artists per family. And so um, we're all secretly collecting. There's a lot of stuff here. There's a lot of stuff in the attics and the basements. I, um, my supply issue is that I have so much, I'm constantly overwhelmed by how much is coming in. And I'm always doing my best to keep the flow going and keeping it <laughs> moving out at the same time. Mm. And, you know, we've lost the skills, haven't we, really? But I guess COVID re-interested people and in where yeah. food and fibre and all that come, came from. Yeah, the things that are really basic to human life, food, shelter, clothing, and love, right? Those are the only things that you need. And we have really lost some skills in uh, how to make any of those things. Also, the big benefit is a benefit to well-being and uh, you know health and well-being social c connection all of that kind of thing do you want to tell us a bit about your perspective there yeah i mean if you've ever worn a handmade garment you know the feeling of love that overcomes you when you put it on or the feeling of not wanting to throw it away because it feels really special just they feel different even something that you've mended for yourself um, or if someone's made something for you and i think about what we're putting on when we put on fast fashion that has come from such destructive places that that just sort of in a woo-woo way um, is not so nice and that we can treat ourselves better by wearing custom clothes or um, secondhand clothing, but also for gender expression, for uh, body size. I mean, when you go to fast fashion and go to re uh, pre-made clothing, um, or what do they call it? What is it? Uh, ready to wear, right? It presumes everyone's about the size same size proportions, which everyone isn't about the same size proportions, and we aren't broken. It's that 
the system is, doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. And so those things alone, like it's deeply, just deeply empowering to make your own clothing. Um, I think it's revolutionary to make your own clothing. Gandhi was spinning his own cotton and making his own clothing. The hippies were making their own clothing. You can't have a revolution in your parents' uniform um, or the uniform that's been handed to you. So for like American individualism, it really seems like a great practice would be making your own outfits. Um, but also then I believe that we're built for it, right? So as a school teacher, I was like, these are not ADHD girls. These are fiber artists who are in school instead of learning fiber arts. A fidget spinner is as dazzling as a spin, as a spinning, a drop spindle. And it used to be that it was, you know, I, the children were helping with spinning because if you need thread, you need a lot of thread and it takes everyone to do it. I think a fidget spinner works because of drop spindles. I think when you take the knitting out of my hands, I become an ADHD person because I need that fidget in order to pay attention, in order to stay grounded because I believe I'm built for it. So I think that it's not that the fiber arts are therapeutic. I think that being separated from the fiber arts is untherapeutic and that it creates a lot of distress in us to not be doing these really basic things that every human has participated in up until just about the last hundred years and that's it so i the it's i don't even think of it as a corrective i think that the injury happened when we when when we went to huge industrialization and we were separated from the reality of what it takes to be a human, which is that you have to make your own clothes. So what do you think the journey back is? You know, because it's not being taught much in schools. Not many people, when you walk down the street, not many are really making their own clothes. So it has to be cool, mm. which has to be cool. Yeah. Custom is king. It has to be cool. And that's part of what I think my job is, is I'm this conduit from an older generation who sews in kind of a stuffy way, but they're the ones who are who are giving us all of their stuff and we really love them. And then I am trying to pass it down to generations younger than I am really, um, and be like, guys, this is cool. Isn't it cool how you can make your own, cl it's cool how you can like wear your own custom stuff, that's cool. Um, it has to be cool. You know, it has to be better. It has to be better and more valuable than um, the other stuff. And with clothing, that usually comes not with anything that has to do with reality of quality or time spent making something or what the fibers contain. That system is so, it's so whack all the time. It's so arbitrary what anything costs, like a coach bag versus something at Target, that it's like the real value is in the coolness. So I think it just has to be cool. And when your own hands and energy are in it, it, it feels different. Oh my God, 100%. And you, it's harder to, to get rid of the items that you've worked on. And so then they will replace many, many items in the future that will never come to you because you already have that really nice, you know, cardigan that you wear because it's yours, because it's your clothing. It's not just something that's passing through your life. It's actually yours and a part of your identity. I think it's quite dehumanizing to change your clothes so much. Sort of forget who you are. You know, those are your clothes. They can be yours, the ones that you wear. So having, so what about the, you know, the modernity and the search for new and always having it? Is there something there like that we, we do adapt and get used to things quickly so maybe we like a bit of freshness all the time how can we yeah. address that well i think just becoming capable just being able to to manipulate the things around you you can be constantly refreshing your wardrobe by changing things or getting thrift store clothes and altering them i mean that's fine the truth is every there's so much stuff everywhere like we are trash rich you know that I think finding the supply is not the problem. The problem is like being capable of doing what you want to be able to do. And that just takes practice and study. I think unfortunately sewing is kind of like a musical instrument where it's best learned when you're a child because there's so much to learn in this world that you actually never, you could practice for a lifetime and never master it. That's why I love it because I'm always captivated by something new, but, um, but whatever, anyone can learn at any age. And um, part of also, it takes very little to make a garment, like to be legally dressed takes very little, like a togo counts, you know, or you could overwhelm yourself in wanting to make an Edwardian sculpture gown. But so 
having sort of a realistic understanding of like what you are capable of and just that like really simple things can be quite beautiful quite easy to actually make um and then for all the rest of us we all just need to know like hey that's cool that's custom you you know you're making it yourself that's the coolest thing and that like it's a good look to have like patched clothes and to have clothes that look like you've worn them for a long time that that means that you're like paying attention and doing the right thing you know um that there's nothing shameful in all of that I like to say sewing is easy. Even girls can do it, you know. <laughs> and it starts just with a needle and thread, doesn't it? You know, like you don't need even to be using a sewing machine initially. Mm -hmm. I mean, and to be honest, like a hot glue gun kind of welds fabric together. Don't tell, you know, don't tell the old timers I said that. But scissors, cutting, tying, you could even, you know, that's how with little kids, that's where it usually starts actually, right, is cutting tying and gluing and then they I have free fabric for children at my shop because I want them to be able to just take it home and have their parents not care what they do with it um, so they can just actually play with it and manipulate it and get a sense of it um, but yeah it really it can start with such basic almost almost very few instruments and then you can make it as complicated as you want and so tell us about your big dream then about, you know, every town having one of these, you know, and maybe what you'd like to see about skill levels in the next generation. So I've started a business group of people who are excited to try to start thrift stores like mine all over. And um, I want to be able to grow, go on a cross country road trip across the United States and stop at these little towns all across at little thrift stores of fabric that really reflect the local community and the local flavor of what is happening in that town because it is the very fabric of the people of their stashes that they've collected um and i believe that every town in america and the world can sustain it because there are a lot of us and there is a lot in in these attics and basements um and i hope that if anything, I just, my bare minimum is that I hope the next generation knows that it's not a machine that makes their clothing and that it's a person who's sitting behind a sewing machine that makes their clothing and that there is human and agricultural value in every item of clothing. I think people are so disconnected that that's literally like my base, um, my bare minimum is I just hope through whatever my practice is that people get that much and then my real hope is that i and i see it happening already i see evidence when people tag me on instagram and TikTok all the time is that people start to learn to sew and i have a whole lot of people under my belt that i can say like oh at the beginning of this shop and of all of this like that person didn't know how to sew very well and now look at them they're making like almost all of their clothing um and that to me you know i haven't had much time to sew myself uh, I have had time to alter pieces, but um, to me, that feels like I did it. I mean, it feels like a, a great reward, a huge reward. We had a whole fashion show here last year of people who had made their own clothing, and it was funny because half of the people looked like outrageous sculptures, and half of the people looked like they were just in their street clothes because they were just in their street clothes. <laughs> and then I walked out at the end as if I was the designer who had like done it all, and I hadn't done anything except sold them the fabric. <laughs> But it's so that to me is like deeply, um, deeply rewarding. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and tell us where here is. Just give us a bit of a. Oh, we're in Western Massachusetts in the United States, um, and it's a rural area. It's like a liberal rural area. So it's a rare United States rural spot that um, is democratic, and uh, people here have been. We have a lot of farms around here it's a very fertile farming valley and for many 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 years this valley has been like a front runner in farm shares and understanding sort of like local agriculture and there's a huge movement of that around here so people here it felt were really ready for this pandemic and for lockdown like calling all your farmer friends making sure you had your food and um but so there's a good general atmosphere of understanding of the value of recycling and of sort of environmentally friendly business here um, and I've had a really good response but 
I've had an excellent response all over the country and the world. I have plenty of people from Australia asking me to ship internationally, and I say, why don't you join my business group? Because <laughs> I think you should keep it more local. I think that defeats the purpose. <laughs> mm. And was there a textile industry here in the past? Actually, yes. Um, so especially in eastern Massachusetts and Lowell, there was one of the most famous labor um, strikes and, fought, and hard won fights uh, happened in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is just out east towards Boston. Um, this town itself was a paper town, but there was fabric all around here. Yeah, not anymore. The industry has been completely destroyed. Hmm. Is there any way back, do you think, to local production? I mean, I, now that cannabis is legal, I wonder if there's a hemp industry that could be formed. Hmm. Because it seems like a waste product from the cannabis industry that could be pretty well taken advantage of. Mm. And it creates like a linen-like fabric. It's gorgeous. Mm. And but that's for someone else to figure out, not me. It's just a really good idea. <laughs> and how do you describe yourself? What would you say you're doing? Um, I say that I am creating a reused textile store that specializes in um, t uh, the resale of stashes from other home sewers and that my focus is less there's a few businesses like mine who are dealing with industry and they deal with like the fashion industry and um, ends from mills and things and I am more in the business of transfer just from household to household of from the home sewer stash to the home sewer stash essentially I think you're a bit more than that. You're actually an entrepreneur and a change agent. Oh, and, well, me, you mean and, like... And an, an inspiring person as well. <laughs> I am, thank you. I am on a mission to inspire, that's true. And, I ha and I've been trying to build a social media following to um, really just like get it out there that like people can do this, they can be capable. And I really want to promote a feeling of uh, self-sufficiency in people um, where they feel like, well, if I needed to fix my zipper, I could fix my zipper, you know, mm. instead of being zipperless suddenly. So it's kind of disempowered and lacking agency really is where we're at through the loss of skills, isn't oh, it? Oh, absolutely. I think, and I think we lose a lot of our humanity that way. I think we can feel pretty, pretty empty. And so the, the feeling of feeling capable also to me is one of the finest feelings there is um so as far as also mental wellness i mean feeling like you can do the things that you need to do is like a not depressing feeling mm. and, <laughs> and reducing waste too is a big thing isn't it oh yeah i mean abs in my shop it feels like everything's a win 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 for everyone involved the people donating the people who are able to afford the fab the finest fabrics that there are. Uh, the environment is uh, preserved a little bit. Uh, you know, more human uh, exploitative labor isn't used. It just, it feels really good. Also, what happens all day at my shop is that really friendly people bring me their nicest things and they give them to me as a gift. And I just receive Christmas presents of my favorite kind of stuff all day long <laughs> and I get to look at all of it and we pour over it and we talk about it and there have been plenty of tears shed and stories told and it seems whenever anyone requests something it comes in the next week like we're we're definitely like haunted by friendly ghosts and like taken care of by some kind of guardians um it's an the the emotional benefits of just dealing with basically women and sharing textile all day is for me, one of the most, I feel more incredible <laughs> than I ever have in my life. I feel more self-actualized and more taken care of and more sort of like whole in my heart than I ever have. It's been, it, it's the most amazing thing. It's really incredible. And things like at my business, I don't have my inventory insured um, very much. And I don't keep track of it because if I were to have a fire, my insurance is that the next day it would this place would be rebuilt with by the hands of my community with all of our stashes and it would be better than it was before. I wouldn't have to go through an adjuster. I wouldn't have to wait for any period of time. It would just happen. That's my insurance policy is my community goodwill is what I pay into for that. 
And there are a lot of moments in the business that are like that. We operate, I like to say, mostly on a gift economy where it's really a small amount of money just to keep things going, but that it's all mostly gift exchange. And living in that kind of space within like the capitalist runaround world uh, feels pretty amazing. And we don't have any emergencies, you know, everything's just kind of like a nice thing that's happening. Sounds great. Um, interestingly, though, you talked about some mainly female community, and that really ties into the history of textiles, that it's always been kind of like a female area, do you think? How can men engage? Well, I like to say that I don't think that it's only for women, but that it's inherently, it is inherently feminine. So even when men are engaging, I think they're engaging with a feminine thing, which is fine. Men can engage with the feminine. Um, and um, I don't know, they have to make it cool. <laughs> it has to be cool to do it. Hang out with your bros and sew. But um, I think that- There were uh, young men in the shop when I came today, which was were? great. There were three young men there today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. yeah. younger generations, there is, they're just, I think they've been working so hard at eliminating the um, negative barriers that gender imposes on people's lives. And this is one of them, the sort of, um, uh, gatekeeping of this world from men um, and so although gay like especially gay men have like a long history in the fiber arts of course and costume and in fashion and everything um, so it's complicated but I think that just like it's like less of a big deal now than it used to be and that the drive for custom fashion um, is really a big part of getting men involved but yeah, I mean, I have like buddies my age now who are like picking up sewing so that they can make quilts. And so my peers are now starting to do it, even my like boyfriends and, you know, and some of my girlfriends. So um, it, uh, I think, again, it's just got to be cool. But they are making it cool. I think they're doing it. I think they're doing it already.